Okay, now that we've learned about far field zone, which is uh, with respect to wavelengths farther from the antenna, let us see what are the consequences of being in the far field zone. Essentially, the simple answer is it simplifies electromagnetic fields so for us, and we can model them as plane waves. So to, uh, to give you an idea, for example, assume that you have this antenna. And this antenna, let's assume that it creates for you a wave front in the shape of a sphere. As you go farther and farther from the antenna, this spherical wave front becomes larger and larger and larger. So you essentially, when you are looking at an antenna, if this is your antenna, and imagine this is, for example, a spherical wave front that you have, when you go very far, this sphere becomes very huge. So and you essentially don't see the curvature of that anymore. So for example, if you are around here and looking, you essentially see a planar wave front. And you can realize that when you are, for example, dropping a stone in the water and it creates these cylinders and this cylinder gets larger and larger and larger. So when you are in the far field, you can essentially assume that electromagnetic fields are plane waves. So this is, very important and it makes uh, makes calculation much easier so when we are in the far field zone we assume that our electromagnetic fields are plane waves so this is what we assume and that essentially means for example that uh, if you have this this is your e this is going to be h so e is perpendicular to h and both of them are perpendicular to the direction of propagation so so as you see these are all perpendicular so e is perpendicular to h so e and h are vector and also they're perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Now, what is the direction of propagation? If you consider a spherical coordinate, so, and then I ask you, for example, let's assume, for example, a sphere. If you go this way, or this way, or this way, or this way, these are the, you propagating outward, so, so, these are all, these vectors are all R hats. And that's the amazing thing about the spherical coordinate, because if you wanted to represent these uh, vectors in, for example, Cartesian coordinate, if this is X, this is Y, this would have been Y hat. But then this time, this would be X hat. Then this would be Z hat. And this would be a combination of x hat y hat and z hat but the amazing thing is that when you choose a spherical coordinate all of these vectors are essentially r hat so to remind you r hat is the unit vector along r so if this is this are, are a spherical coordinate if you have a point remember you connect this point this distance is r and the unit vector along that is r hat so when you're radiating outward so any location that you stand, you can think of it as r hat. So that's why I'm going to write r hat here so as the direction of propagation. You you're outward. So if it goes this way, it's r hat. If it goes this way, the unit vector is also r hat. So e and h and r hat. And also another thing that you know is that if you want to calculate h. So H, in terms of its magnitude, would be magnitude of E divided by intrinsic impedance of free space, which is 377 ohm approximately. So eight or not is the intrinsic impedance of free space, uh, 120 pi, uh, 377 ohm. So this is what we have. So the magnitude of H is directly related to magnitude of E. And I want you to, uh, to notice here that this is very similar to the equation that we have in circuit when we say V equal RI. So remember in circuit we have V equal RI and or you, we can write I equal V divided by R. Now, remember that H by nature has the similar dimension as I. I 
in terms of dimension is amp. This is amp per meter. Now, V is volt. Electric field is volt per meter. And R is ohm. And A tar naught is also ohm. So this is essentially our V equal Ri in free space. And A tar naught is for free space. If we have antenna in a different medium, for example, water, then you have to use the impedance of water. So to just remind you, eta is defined as mu naught divided by epsilon naught in air. So if you have a different medium, then uh, assuming that it's non-magnetic, so it would be mu naught, but then epsilon naught could change. Then you have epsilon naught and relative epsilon of that medium. For example, for water, this is around, this is number is around 80. So if you approximate it by 81 uh, and then take the square root, it's going to be nine times smaller. So that's our, that's the two important things that we have in the far field zone. So E and H and our perpendicular to, to R. And uh, so H is also related to E, and remember that we call this transverse electromagnetic because E and H and the direction of propagation are perpendicular. So this is our TEM, essentially. Now, now uh, let's, let's write the equation for uh, this was R hat. Now, let's write the equation for E, for example, in the, uh, in the most general form, and then we try to simplify that. So E, of course, is a vector. And in general, in a spherical coordinate, it can be a function of R, theta, and phi. That's the most general form. And then, uh, because it's a vector, it can have R component, theta component, and phi component. So, so E can have R component. And R component can be itself as a function of R, theta, and phi. This is in the r hat direction plus e theta component r theta and phi theta hat plus e phi r theta phi in the direction of phi hat. So you see, I started with the vector e and then I decompose that into r hat, theta hat, and phi hat. The R hat component, I call it E subscript R, E subscript theta for theta hat component, and E subscript phi for uh, phi hat component. And each component can be a function of R, theta, and phi. That means where you are in this space. Now, based on what we just discussed, that in the far field zone, E and H are perpendicular to R hat, that essentially means your electric field in the far field does not have any R component. Because as you see, this is perpendicular to R hat, so it cannot have R component. So essentially, this does not exist in the far field. You might have that in the near field, but in the far field, you don't have the R component. It's perpendicular. So I get only these two components. There is another thing which is uh, which is which enabled us to define radiation pattern in the far field in the first place, but we didn't put it into the mathematical equation. It, it, and is that that is the R dependency that you see here is of a very specific form. So the R dependency you see that both of them are function of R, which is the distance from the antenna. So let me remind you again that if you have for example, an antenna, this would be your R. This is the observation point, for example. This is theta. And if you project it here, this angle is phi. So now the R dependency is of a specific form. And in fact, it can be shown that in the far field, the R dependency is in the form of e to the power of minus jkr divided by R. And k is your wave number. So k is 2 pi divided by lambda, it's, uh, your wave number. So this is our R dependency. So instead of writing it in terms of R, I can just say, OK, this is my R dependency, and I take it out from here. So I can write it as 
e to the power of minus j k r divided by r, and the only thing that remains is the angular dependency. And I'm going to put a, a superscript not here to just say that I, I, I removed r dependency to the and, and I, I place it outside. I fa factored it out, and the phi component would be the same thing plus e to the power of minus j k r r e phi naught just theta and phi phi hat. So you see here that essentially this is the r dependency. And now we have it as a different expression. We, we just factored it out. And this is very important in the far field. And, and the reason, I mean, if you want to understand this, that why the R dependency is in this form, let me begin by perhaps the denominator. So you see, if you have an antenna like this, and it, you consider that the energy goes as spheres. So the total energy that's passing through this sphere, of course, I'm showing it as, uh, as a circle here, but consider it a sphere, would be equal to the total power that's going out from here. So if you look at that, but, but then you realize something that the area of the sphere, the area of this sphere is 4 pi r square, and r is the radius of this sphere. But now when you go to this sphere, now the area is larger. So the area is larger, and therefore the electric field needs to drop by a factor of r. So you see, the area increases and the way that it is increases is by r squared when you go from this sphere to this sphere so for the total power passing through this two sphere to be the same then electric field needs to drop by a factor of r now why by a factor of r and not r squared because remember that power density is related to magnitude of E squared. So you need to square E to get to your power density. And you, if you square E, that you have R here, and then you square the R, you get your R squared, and it's canceled by the fact that the area of the sphere increases. So that's the reason for having just R to the power of one in the denominator. But uh, this is the phase term, and this essentially shows that uh, waves is traveling in the plus r hat direction. So again, to, to understand that, similar to what we mentioned before, if you convert that to time domain, so this is a phasor. If you want to convert it to time domain, you take the real part of phasor times e to the power of j omega t. If you do that, this term here turns into cos omega t minus kr. So as you see, as time increases, as time goes by, as time increases, for this to be constant, which now we're talking about the specific point on the wave front, for this to be constant, R needs to increase. So we say as time increases, R increases. So that means if this point is here right now, next time it's traveling in the plus R direction. So that essentially shows that the wave is traveling in the plus R hat direction. This essentially shows that the total power uh, stays the same. But then the signal at a specific point, which is the electric field at that point, drops by a factor of r. Remember that a sphere gets larger and larger and larger. So this is, this is essentially what we have right now. And now, based on this, we can do a couple of things. Uh, for example, one thing that you can notice here is that what, the, what is the field pattern? If, if I want to represent field pattern with, with a mathematical expression, what would be my field pattern? So if I want to have my field pattern, then what is field pattern? Is essentially magnitude of E. How do you find magnitude of E? You take the square root of this component square plus this component square, which would be 
magnitude of e to the power of minus j k r r e theta naught square plus maybe I, I'll have the theta and phi component too plus e to the power of minus j k r r e phi naught theta phi square remember that e to the power of j theta anything e to the power of j theta is in terms of magnitude is one so i can ignore these two components so i'm going to end up with one divided by r square e theta naught theta phi square plus one divided by r square e phi naught theta phi square so this would be my essentially field pattern now if you if you consider for example power pattern you need to square this because power is related to magnitude of e square so you square this so then magnitude of e square would be related to one r square then e theta naught theta phi square plus e phi naught theta phi square so now if you if you look at that so as you change the distance from the antenna which is this r you get of course a different magnitude of e square you you get a different power pattern but as soon as you normalize it to the maximum the effect of r is gone and the only thing that remains is this one and this one as you see does not depend on r and that's why if you have your power pattern or or field pattern and you every time you normalize it to the maximum essentially the fact the, the effect of r has been factored out and you don't see that the only thing that you see is the angular dependency and uh, therefore when you change the distance in the far field you essentially see the same radiation pattern